Kia ora, I'm Erica Wilkinson, New Zealand's Acting Thread and Species Ambassador, and this is the Doc Sounds of Science podcast. Every episode, we talk about work being done behind the scenes by Doc's technical experts, scientists, rangers, and the experts in between. Kia ora, ko Erica Wilkinson tēnā. Ke kona i pūrangi tēnā e pā ana ki ngā Sounds of Science. Today we're talking to one of my favourite ecologists, uh, if you're allowed to have favourites when you work at DOC, Jess Scrimger. Kia ora, Jess. Kia ora, Erica. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Jess Scrimger toku ingoa, kei te mātanga mātai hauropi i te papa atawhai ki tūrangi. Kia ora. Hi everyone, my name is Jess Scrimger. I'm a Technical Advisor Ecology with Department of Conservation and I'm based here in the beautiful Tūrangi in central North Island. It's great to have you here. Jess is one of the country's premier ecologists. Uh, during her career with Te Papa Atawai, she's worked with creatures big and small. She's monitored kākāpō on Whenua Ho, searched for the Mohunui giant weta and te kuiti, led the National Kiwi Recovery Programme and given advice on just about every species you could imagine. So tell me about your job. What's your role at DOC? Well, my formal title is Technical Advisor, which doesn't tell anyone very much about what I do. So if you have an ecological problem, then you can come to me, whether you're inside of DOC or outside, and my job is to help you find an answer or give you advice on how to solve that problem. Uh, and I would say most of the time I don't know the answer, so my job is to talk to all of the wonderful people around the country and uh, come up with a solution or an answer that helps make your life easier and makes you successful in conservation. So you're an expert in ecology as a as a umbrella completely yeah yeah so although I know some things um and some things well I'm more of a generalist and if anything the skill is about how to uh find the right information across many different sources and then I get to learn along the way how did you get into this work so I like to tell my backstory uh which is that I was raised in South Africa and I was lucky enough to be raised on a national park. So in South Africa, these parks are, are far more tourist based. So you have your bungalows and your hotels. And my dad was the electrician there. But a lot of my friends and uh, the parents of my friends were conservationists and rangers. So I got lots of experiences on the back of Utes chasing after zebras or wildebeest, um, going to look at vultures coming to feed on a carcass. And then my parents announced that as a teenager, we're moving to New Zealand. And I didn't think there was that many exciting things in New Zealand to pay attention to. And so as I started to uh, settle in and get to know New Zealand a lot better, I've come to realize that actually New Zealand is way better and have a lot more unique and interesting things Um and so, yeah, in high school, I decided to pick up biology, and here I am. Even though there are no zebras, it's still cooler. Oh, yes, much better, and we'll talk more about that. We I'm sure, sure I can convince you <laughs> how awesome everything is. What do you like most about your work? What do you get out of it? Uh, so something that I, I like the most, I think, is – Although I'm based in Turangi, I get to work with really passionate people across the country. So on any given day, I might be talking to people in Te Tai Tokoro in Northland all the way down to Rakiora, Stewart Island. Um, and there's this real sense, I think, that we're all aiming to make a difference and that you get the opportunity to make a difference. Um, and so... So, yes, when you go out in the field and you get to see what it is that you're protecting and where you're trying to make a difference, that gives you that real sense of purpose. Um, but what keeps me coming back day to day are the people and the way we're working together to, to get the job done. You, you've helped on some really big projects and you started at DOC with the Kākāpō recovery team. Is that right? Yeah, what a lucky start. What a um, start. I As know. a summer job. <laughs> yeah, it was just, um, it was a, a summer job. I was still at university uh, and I had the privilege of going down to Whenua Ho. Um, and really the only thing I was there to do is to do what others told me to do, the things they didn't necessarily want to do. So if you wanted that signal check for that kākāpō on the highest point, uh, then they would send me. 
And so um, it was a really great opportunity, I think, to see conservation in action for the first time. You know, you're in the middle of nowhere. You don't have all the luxuries of civilization around you. You have to walk everywhere. Everything's so green. And then um, to make it all worth it, you get to interact with this incredibly charismatic bird uh, that you fall in love with instantly. And so after that summer, there was no changing my mind. The conservation and working with Department of Conservation was it. And I, I haven't looked back. Wow. So for the last four years, you've been with the National Kiwi Recovery Team. What have, what have you been up to there? So I've been leading the Kiwi Recovery Group. So the Kiwi Recovery Group are a group of experts um, that sit both within DOC and outside. And our job is to essentially set the strategic direction. So what's the plan for the next 10 years to make sure that all five species of kiwi are heading in the right direction? And so often when we think about kiwi, we think about brown kiwi in the North Island. Um, but uh, in the South Island, we've got, so our rarest kiwi species, for instance, is the roi. And we've only got, you know, 600 individuals left in the entire world for roi. Um, and so our job is to, to work with everyone around the country to make sure that uh, we don't lose kiwi. And kiwi is such an iconic species. Uh, and everyone, it's just been amazing to see this collective effort that has gone in from hundreds of groups outside of DOC and that kind of passion and dedication. So it's been a real privilege to say that I've been a part of that um, across the country for the last four years. That's incredible. What what do you think is the biggest misconception people have around conservation? So I've been really lucky in my career to work with really high-profile species, but at the same time work on a whole range of species that people don't even know exist. And so one of the greatest misconceptions that I've noticed is that when I say that I work in conservation, people get really excited about that. Uh, it's, you know, it's a really sexy kind of um, career to have. And the things that they tend to quote to me are um, kiwi, kākāpō, uh, kōkāko, you know, those really big high profile. And across the board, we're really good at selling our success stories for these species. And in actual fact, in the background, a lot of conservation is just heartbreaking and a lot of that, from my experience, tends to be the species that um, aren't in the limelight and, um, you know, sort of in the background that people don't even know are going in the wrong direction. So as an example, um, if you're driving past Lake Topol, between Turangi and Topol, there's this random little island sitting in the middle of the lake, and it's called Mochitaikul. And on this island, we've got this tiny, nondescript species of snail called Wainuia clarkai. And for a long time, so we don't exactly know how the snail got out there, but for a long time this has been the stronghold for the species. Um, they get nobbled by rats and hedgehogs and possums. And rats got out to the island, and now we can't find them anymore. So we got rid of the rats, and we're really hopeful that maybe a few have hung on and that if we go check again that they might still be there. But I think often about everyone driving past this island, looking at it and not thinking about it very much with this potential that this incredible loss had happened and you just don't even know about it. And I can think of, of a number of examples of things that I've worked on where we're not winning, where things are going backwards and it's heartbreaking. Um, and so I personally am on a bit of a crusade to bring these cryptic species up in profile so that if you can see the effort that goes into the things people care for, like kiwi, like kākāpō, and we could bring that to other species where people don't know they're there or they're hard to love, well, I'm here to tell you how lovable they are. And so my crusade is on. Begins now. So it begins. Okay. So let's start. What is a cryptic species? Okay. So a cryptic species is... Um, a species that is hard to find. So they're not very obvious and not a lot of people know about them. So 
there's a bit of mystery around them, I think. Uh, it's either, so for instance, Pika Pika bats, they're only found at nighttime, so they're not visible. And when they do fly around, they use no sound. So the way they navigate is with this echolocation in a hearing range that humans can't pick up without a device. And so you could wander around the bush all you like and never know that right above you is all this life, all this activity happening. Um, or they're incredibly good at camouflaging themselves. So you can be in the bush going for a walk and not know that there is um, this really interesting bug sitting there or a frog or a lizard. Um, and so, yeah, so cryptic species just hard to find um, and a bit of a challenge, really. But just as important as kākāpō. Exactly. What, what are your favourites of the cryptics? Do you have some? If I had to think about a favourite, it's the one that catches you by surprise, I think. So this is something that I really like about cryptic species. So if I go back to that snail, Wainuia clarkai, it's the size of a 50-cent piece and it's brown. Like it's a, a devil of a thing to find in leaf litter. You really have to work for it. And they hide from you and it sits there. But when they eventually decide to poke a head out, they're just this radiant purple colour that completely catches you by surprise. Um, and that's the kind of stuff that really connects you to it. Uh, and one of my other favourites that, <laughs> that has a similar effect talking about purple um, is, is the peripetus. Now, the peripetus... Mm. There's something that hides from you and you kind of stumble across them. And uh, so when I'm out there doing snail monitoring, occasionally, if you're lucky, you get this beautiful, looks like a worm, but it isn't. It's called, or well, its common name is called a velvet worm. But what's amazing about it is that it is unchanged for the last 500 million years. So it's not related to a worm. It's not related to an insect. It's somewhere in between. And they reckon it's going to be in the same clade as like tardigrades, which are the little water bears that, you know, are indestructible, can exist in space kind of thing. Um, but what I like about the peripetus, one, when you find it, it's like a treasure that you found. But two, the surprise factor is that when it gets scared or it's trying to catch something, it spits the sticky substance at you, which catches you by surprise. So I think when it comes to choosing a favourite, it's really hard to. They've all got these amazing qualities. But I have a particular fondness for those that kind of catch you by surprise. That is, that's very cool. Um, how do you feel about the polyphanta? Ah, the polyphanta. So they are amazing. So they're a carnivorous giant land snail. And what I mean by that is that they have the ability to suck up worms like spaghetti and they are fast. Like you think they're slow. There's this clip you should, everyone should Google it. There's a clip of a polyphanta sitting there really quietly and then suddenly it lashes out and grabs this worm and it just catches you completely by surprise. Um, we, have, we have these plots out in the Kaimanua it's really interesting, actually. So the, the thing that gets them are possums, but it's a learned behavior. So we've got this population split by a river, and on one side, the possums have learned how to get them, but on the other side, the possums haven't. And so, we, so we're protecting or trying to get all of the possums that have this behavior out of the way. Um, but on the other side of the river, we don't have to bother because for some reason, they're just not queuing into it. And I don't know why. Um, but the problem being is that just as soon as we've kind of cracked this one conservation challenge, and we're doing really well, they're, they're going all in the right direction. And then about 10 years ago, uh, we went out and we, we found all these shells beautifully intact. Um, so it was definitely not a possum, not a rat, none of that. And uh, it coincided with particularly dry year. And so what we're finding now that as things are getting drier, um, you know, climate change, there's all these models showing that parts of New Zealand are just going to get worse. Not only are we going to have drier conditions, um, but 
the condition of our forests aren't great. We've got all these browsers eating out the understory, so we haven't got this ability to hold on to the moisture. And now we're starting to see um, that affecting our polyphanta. Um, so there's a whole new challenge there for us that we're going to have to try and figure out. It, it must be really difficult working with cryptic species in terms of unless you know exactly where they are. Like uh, we talked to Dr. Emma Williams about bitten and how difficult they are to find. What's it like working with a cryptic species? Yeah, I think the problem is that there's a reason that they're hard to find. And so um, I used to work on Archie's frogs or Pepe Katua, and they only come out at night and you want it to be raining because then they are more visible. So you're there at one o'clock in the morning with rain dripping down your face, with your nose inches away from the ground, looking for this beautiful pepper couture that's just so camouflaged. Oh, they're adorable. And so you're always apparently um, exhausted. Uh, it's nighttime. You want it to be raining. Same with the snails. You want it to be raining. So you're out there again with your face inches from the ground, just crawling this is the sexy muck, side of cultivation. For them, <laughs> and they're hiding from you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there just appears to be this common theme that you're either out at night, so whether it's picker picker bats trying to find them, um, or it's snails or it's pepper katua, you're just apparently always sleep deprived, wet, muddy, um, and somehow crawling around on the ground most of the time. So yeah, good times. Work in conservation, they said. <laughs> It could be quite uh, difficult to love these species without experiencing them. Some people might think that cryptic species are boring or that they don't matter. Why is that wrong? Yeah, I think there's a, a misconception that um, these animals that are considered cryptic tend to be the ones that don't show a lot of expression, right? So they don't have big eyes. They're not usually cute. They don't show when they're in pain. They're just expressionless. And that gets translated as boring or um, that they don't feel things. Um, and that, I think, is harder for us to connect to as humans. So we're more connected to mammals and we're more connected to birds with, uh, with big eyes or, or we can kind of put a human characteristic on them. You know, like if you think about Kiwi, they're monogamous, which means that uh, they will pair for life often. And so you have this real attachment to that feeling of romance. Um, but again, that element of surprise that if you start to dig deeper into, into cryptic species um, and you, you set aside this preconceived idea that they're boring or that um, they're not like us. So as an example, if I, if I go back to Archie's pepper katua, Archie's frog. Um, you wouldn't think about frogs as parents. But in this instance, um, when they lay eggs, they guard the eggs and they stay with the eggs and they protect it. And they don't have a tadpole stage. So when the babies are born, often they will climb onto the parent, often that's the father, and then the father will carry them around on their backs. Um, and take care of them until they're ready to to go out into the world. And so so there's more than meets the eye, and there's more that connects them to who we are as humans than you think. And it's it's just worth looking. And we just need to find those hooks um, in order to to translate, you know, when it's not a charismatic megafauna. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, so where this all links together is the apathy, and so we're not getting the attention. So the things that do drive um, our cryptic species are even the threats we don't understand. So that's like hedgehogs, mice, wasps. So it's all kind of connected. And so if we got people to care more, potentially, uh, especially if things are going wrong, there'd be more pressure to do more. That makes me think of doing something like invertebrates of the year. We've got bird of the year, charismatic megafauna, all the big eyes. It's all happening. Um, and that makes me think of Pekka Pekka you've talked about winning 2021. Very controversial. Um, tell me your favorite things about this species, these species. 
Yeah. So first of all, congratulations to Pekka Pekka for winning Manu of the Year. I was very excited. Um, but that's the point you're making. So these kind of events, I feel like the profile of Pekka Pekka has just skyrocketed. Everyone's talking about it, paying attention to it. Um, so increasingly with my crusade for cryptic species, if Pekka Pekka become too popular, then um, I'm going to have a real conflict of um, conscious then. So I've got to have to find a balance there. But across the board, if I have to pick a favorite species, then it is the short tail Pekka Pekka. And there's so many things I can talk about. Um, but I think my favorite part about them, talking about wanting to assign some human characteristics to an animal, um, I just think it, there's a lot of romance tied into their courting, um, their rituals that they have. So how this works is that you've got these male bats, these male pecker pecker, and they get into these what they call singing roots. And so most of the time you can't hear pecker pecker because they're at a level you, you can't even perceive but when they're in these singing roosts and then they start to sing, it is something that you can sit there at night time and you can listen to them. And the whole point of it is that they gather in these clusters to try and impress the females and they sing their hearts out to try and get her attention. So she'll get to, into these groups and she'll kind of wander around, she'll make her assessment, and then whoever sings the best gets to have some attention. And what I like the most about this is that the study has shown that the bats that tend to be more successful are the smaller males. So for those who know me, I am five foot one, so I have an affinity for small things. And so that's something I really like is that um, they reckon that these smaller males, because maybe they don't have to spend so much energy during the night's foraging because they're lighter, that they have more energy they can put into courtship. So they sing a lot more and therefore are tending to get a lot more females. Um, and so that's probably where the romance ends because they're incredibly promiscuous. So uh, that's a little bit of a bittersweet ending to that story. But then the female, if she, um, after she's mated, she decides that actually now is not the time that I would like to be pregnant. So she just kind of stores it all in there. So they mate usually, you know, late summer, early autumn. And then nothing happens. Just, you know, all of them hang out, wait until it's springtime. And then collectively they decide, all right, let's get pregnant. And then they go for it. And so what that means is that um, a lot of the bats in the population will all have their pups within a week of each other. And then they have these maternity roosts that you could have like thousands of pups sitting in this tree with the mums that kick the boys out, you know, get out, this is woman's business. Um, and then they do this, you know, they say raising a child takes a village. Well, in this case, it takes a roost tree of bats. Um, and what's even more impressive is that when the mum goes out to forage, she'll come back a couple of times a night to feed her pup. And there are thousands of babies, and she manages to find her one every time. So they're really closely connected. And we think it might be a smell thing, but all of that, I just, yeah, it's just super impressive. Wow, talk about assigning human characteristics to species, so we love them. <laughs> I've fallen in love with that. Um, I, I know that we've had also some devastating losses in this area. Um, perhaps you can tell us about Pekka Pekka in Ohakune. Yeah, so, so it is a challenge with Pekka Pekka um, to get them going in the right direction. So think about this. There are up to thousands of them in a tree and they will hang out there for weeks. And so something I really like is when you walk up to it, you can smell them from quite a distance as this kind of really distinctive, ah, there's a bat roost nearby. So if I can smell it, imagine what predators can do. What does it smell like? Oh, it's this kind of musty, 
you know how people say kakapo has a really delightful smell? Mm. Um, I would like to argue is that <laughs> bat guano, <laughs> when sitting for weeks in a roost tree, has a very delightful musky smell. Um, yeah, it's a hard thing to describe, but I think because I associate it with happiness, you know, you're in your happy place when you're out in the field looking for these roost trees and you could have spent hours tracking a bat with a little transmitter on trying to find this tree and often the first thing you know that you're close is when you can smell it and so um so i think there's just a lot of happy memories associated with the smell so for those who have smelled a bat roost and you think it's not great don't judge me for this um but yeah it does mean it attracts a lot of predators and um, one of the most traumatic experiences for us is that we tracked them down to a tree. And then when we got to the base of this tree, there were just little wings had been pulled off these bodies and scattered about. Um, and we, we found a couple of bodies, but they were mangled and torn to bits. And it was just this really shocking, visible um, impact that a predator can have. So the first thing we thought, of course, it's a stoat. They're their key um, predator. We chucked out a trap. 24 hours later, caught a stoat. But the bodies kept piling up. So we finally found one that had some really perfectly spaced bite marks, and we sent it away for autopsy. And they came back a few days later and said, yep, it's probably a cat or a ferret based on the size of the bite. So we put a live um, cage trap out, and within 24 hours, we caught a cat, which was just one of the best days having to finally um, see this thing and no more bats, so no more dead bats after that. So we knew we had him and we got him. Um, so, yeah, so in that all took about a space of a week. And so from the moment we showed up to six days later when we caught the cat, we, we put all the little wings together and all the little bodies together and that cat managed to kill 102 individuals in one go. So, and that's just one cat. And so we've got footage of stoats doing it. They just sort of wander into the roost, pull out some bats, come out, go back in. Um, and that's a real testament of the naivety of our native species is that they just sit there, mm. just hang out. They don't have this response, this defense response that they're supposed to move but, um, yeah, so ironically, 48 hours, they left the roost. <laughs> so I was like, well, now you move. Good one, guys. Um, but I think it shows how vulnerable these populations are. So we had a, um, a short tail population in the Tararua. We knew we only had 300. So if you imagine a cat could kill 102 in a week, you know, it doesn't take much for 300 to blink out. And... We fought so hard to protect that population. We got the traps out. And it was it's not a nearby. You have to, you know, walk for hours to get to it or get in a helicopter. And we fought so hard. And then we had a beach mast, which is where suddenly there's a lot of food in the system. The rats start breeding, which provides foods for stoats. So they start breeding. And between one year and the next, we went back and they were gone. And that was probably one of the most heartbreaking experiences is to, we looked so hard too. We kept looking, we kept hoping, um, but we're pretty sure now that there's not even one left that no matter how hard we fought, we lost them. And so they're still pretty vulnerable, these things. Um, not to be too gloom and, doom and gloom, by the way, but with this Ohakuni population, we have grown them now. And we have recently counted 8,000 short-tailed peka-peka coming out of one tree. So in that instance, despite all of the challenges, we are winning. So that's very exciting. That is very exciting. I'm just wondering how big that tree is. That's <laughs> quite large. Um, so I want to touch on something that you mentioned there. Cats are such a hard topic. Uh, New Zealand has the highest rate of cat ownership in the world or one of them um, I think there's absolutely a way to love your pet cats but also protect our native species too and it all comes down to that responsible pet ownership what does that look like to you yeah so that's definitely something that's come to the forefront as we dealt with this cat issue um, 
So for us, if you're only talking about pika pika, then keeping a cat indoors at night um, will mean that they don't have the ability to get out and um, catch pika pika. And particularly, this is more of a long tail pika pika issue. So what we find with long tail pika pika is that they have they're a little bit more adaptive. They've got the ability to live not only in the forest but in rural properties and even in urban areas. So you might be really surprised to find that you've got pika pika in your backyard. And the um, worst pa- way to find that out is when your cat drags one in. And we've got a lot of stories doing exactly that. Um, and, you know, it's an awful feeling. So keeping a cat indoors at night um, protects Pekka Pekka, but also that's the time when birds, for instance, tend to be a little bit more vulnerable, a bit more sleepy, easier to catch. Um, so that's one of the first things is keep them up in at night. But if you think that your cat will be okay, keep it in all day because that protects lizards, it protects bats, it protects um, birds. Um, but... I know how hard it is when you've got this pet, this cat that you love so much and you wanted to have a good quality life. So you wanted to be able to roam and be free. And so that's a really hard part of being a pet owner is trying to balance that desire to do what's good for the environment, but also be a good owner of your pet. Mm. And let them display those natural characteristics and behavior yeah. that they'll display. So if if we remove that one threat by everyone doing their best kind of pet ownership, would that then give our native species breathing room to manage things like stoats better? Yeah, I find that for every species there's a, a bit of a tipping point. So it's like death by a thousand cuts. So you've got stoats chasing you, you've got cats chasing you, um, possums, In the case of snails, you've also got some thrushes heading your way. Um, For some species, there's dogs and ferrets trying to get to you. And so it is trying to limit or minimize as many of the threats as we can that will then be that tipping point where they'll start to head in the right direction. So as an example for brown kiwi, um, we found that if we stay on top of stoats, and that's the greatest threat to the little chicks, and that gives them a chance to get through to be older. And then if we stay on top of dogs and ferrets, and those are the things that will kill the adults, then if we are good at those, then cats wandering in to grab the odd chick here or there, it doesn't matter too much, or when they get hit by cars. Um, And so it's just trying to find that balance right. So in this example, we've got Pekka Pekka or birds in the garden or lizards hiding in the woodpile, all trying their best to survive a million different things trying to kill them. And so if we just pull one of those things out of the system or we reduce the impact, then the chances of of that animal being able to get a baby through or to survive for another year um, is just that much higher, really. So, yeah, I just think it's our responsibility to make Life that is already hard out there, just a little bit easier. Jess, do you have something that you tell newbies of conservation to get them hooked? What's, what's your inspiring kind of story? When it comes to um, getting people enthusiastic about conservation, I don't know if I have a specific story that I tell and that it is more to get people to understand, I guess, the connection that we all have with nature. And so what it it tends to be is about getting out into the forest or whether it's at the beach and listening to the ocean or anywhere where you feel that connection um, to the nahiri or to the the earth and um, just sitting and being quiet. And I think there's a whole world out there, which I've kind of touched on when you think about um, the idea of cryptic species, that there's so much life happening out there and we're just not aware of it because they're either operating at a frequency that we can't hear or they're hiding from us. And so just to get people out in nature 
And not just to go for a walk or do exercise, but to sit and be mm. quiet and to listen and to connect. Um, that's something that I, I feel really passionately about. A lot of our lives are so busy now, and, and I feel like well-being and mental wellness is such a big thing that we all struggle when we're busy and we're anxious and we're stressed. Um, and I have found that there's nothing better than just proactively going and just being quiet and see how that makes you feel. And I can tell you it's going to make you feel a lot better. How can a person start leveling up their cryptic species knowledge? After this podcast, everyone's going to want to. Okay. I have a game changer and I am basically now giving away my trade secrets because this is the one tool that makes me look like I know what I'm talking about. And it is called Google Lens. Lens is spelled L-E-N-S, no E. And you download this app. You can take a photo of anything. So it's particularly good for fungi and invertebrates. And you take a photo and Google Lens just sifts through, you know, the entire internet. And then whatever algorithm they use, it spits out what they think is the most likely answer to whatever this cryptic thing is you've just taken a blurry photo of. Not only will it tell you what it is, you kind of have, I mean, I would say nine times out of ten, it seems to get it. But not only do you, you see what it is, you also, at your fingertips, get all of this information about this particular species. Um and so when people ring me up and they're like, oh, we've seen the spider, uh, here's a photo of it, what do you think it is? If I can just keep them busy for long enough while I quickly Google lens it, I can speak with quite a lot of confidence in my expertise knowledge about this particular species. And they are amazed. And now this is a gift I'm giving to you. Download Google Lens now. Get outside and start taking some photos and be prepared to have your mind blown. I am so grateful for that gift. It sounds like a vision of iNaturalist on steroids, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, iNaturalist. That's one of my favorite websites to go on. Um, so armed with your Google Lens, you take a photo. Once you're confident you know what it is, or you don't even have to be that confident, um, you can upload it onto this website called iNaturalist. And anyone can load anything. And it's like you're connected to this global community of people observing things in nature and sharing them with you. And you get to see what others have seen. So you can go to a location, for instance, and like, oh, what can I see at this location? Or you can see um, where others have seen a particular species. And then if you're unsure about what it is, you've got this group of experts that may not need Google Lens to be able to confirm to you what that species is. So it's a great way to learn. It's a great way to be part of a, a community of people out there connecting with nature. Um, and it's a great way for others to learn as well from the things that you're seeing. So I highly recommend. Jess, this has been absolutely incredible. I've learned so much. I, I love the stuff about bat singing roosts, all of that. I'm, I've fallen in love with our cryptic species and I bet the rest of Aotearoa will have as well. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. That's all for this episode. If you like what you heard, show us some love with a five-star rating. The Doc Sounds of Science podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts, so subscribe now, never miss an episode. 